Hello world and welcome to my lab. I just wanted to show off my um, 900 watt Tesla coil that I just made. Um, well, I say just made. It's been a product of uh, quite a bit of work. Quite a bit more than I probably should have put into it, but um, it was fun anyways. Uh, what I got here is, uh, like I said, just a 900 watt Tesla coil. It's a type of transformer invented by Nikola Tesla in like 1880, 90 something. And um, I'll just show you the parts. Uh, here I got two 12,000 volt 30 milliamp neon sign transformers fa phased together in parallel to give me 12,000 volts at um, 60 milliamps, which is enough to charge these uh, Cornell de Billier, or however the crap you pronounce it. Uh, these capacitors, each one's rated at uh, 2,000 volts and 0.15 microfarads which um, I've got I think 11 of them hooked up here in parallel which gives me enough voltage at um, something around 0 0.0132 microfarads so uh, I've got that all tuned up. The way I charge them is through a I've got this hooked up in series with a uh, filter. This is just a uh, real low bandpass filter made for the uh, high voltage and 60 hertz frequency put up in the neon sign transformers just to try to protect the transformers from a uh, number one any uh, RF which is why I got the filter circuit and then the uh, the MOTs and the uh, spark gaps that go to the ground are just to pretend it or oh my god protect it from any uh, voltage spikes here um, that again goes into the capacitors they charge for a half of an AC cycle or in this case um, uh, about a quarter of an AC cycle because I have this uh, synchronous rotary spark gap here hooked up and this is a uh, a real kind of neat piece here what I did is this is just a uh, induction motor which I modified for salient pole operation by uh, there's a uh, the core of the motor is a squirrel cage rotor is what they say and it's just a bunch of loops of uh, some conductive material surrounded by zinc or something like that it's doesn't conduct very well and um, what that does is those loops are just big short circuits that make a big magnetic field uh, when, when a magnetic field is induced into them by the uh, magnetic fields produced by this motor and um, this is a uh, four pole motor with a uh, RPM switch to uh, drive a couple little starting coils to start it up and um, what I've done is I've milled four flats in that, uh, that rotor and they're, they're not very big but they're enough to uh, uh, to alter the the flux characteristics of that and give it inductive handles for each phase for each pole to pull on so this is um, modified to be synchronous with the AC cycle which means that if you were to hook this up to a, uh, a dual trace um, oscilloscope what it would do is you'd have the AC cycle going into a display and if you had like a little photo sensor and something to detect for every revolution those uh, instances of the uh, photo detector being triggered and a peak in the AC cycle would be completely coincidental. So um, that, that's what I mean when I say it's locked to the AC cycle. That's handy because what I can do is I can get it such that these capacitors charge for exactly one half or a quarter of the uh, AC cycle. And um, it just gives you a, a greater level of control of over how the uh, device operates. And um, I can control the phase of the motor as it, uh, it differs from the phase of those two transformers, as I'll show you here in a sec. But um, that all goes. The uh, All this is basically just a big switch to uh, let those capacitors charge up and then discharge back and forth through the uh, arc that occurs when those electrodes come into presentation discharge back and forth between the capacitors and this big primary coil what that does is that um, when the uh, discharge is made into the coil makes a big huge magnetic field but once the capacitors are empty there's nothing to sustain that so the uh, magnetic field collapses back on the inductor which produces a current which recharges the capacitors and this happens back and forth uh, several times before all of that energy has been uh, wasted through losses or up into our uh, secondary coil which I'll get into later but um, uh, the, uh, that, that brings up the uh, issue of tuning but um, 
we'll get into that again when I talk about the secondary coil, which I'm going to do now. This is about uh, 900 turns of, I think it was 24 gauge green enameled copper wire. Uh, just it's something like that. I forget, but um, you know, I, I calculated the inductances and all this to get frequencies and such. At uh, one point, I've forgotten all that right now. I built this last summer and I've been optimizing it. But um, basically, what this does is this has a uh, no electrical connection. This coil of wire. This has no electrical connection to anything down here. All this does is this comes down back through, out through that wire, and down to this ground, which is just um, is usually attached right here to this pole. And so basically it's just a big antenna, and what it's receiving is the giant signal that's directed at it by the uh, by this primary coil. And the, uh, the oscillations happen at about 378 kilohertz, which is what this coil is tuned to. Now just like this has a pretty large capacitance and a pretty tiny inductance, this baby has a very, very large inductance and a really, really tiny capacitance, which is why it equals out, um, this is 278 kilohertz, as well as this. So it's like, um, it, you got the swing set analogy coming in here. The right pulses applied at the right time will let you swing your kid up and over the bar sometimes. Well, that is if, ah, never mind, I'm going to be a horrible parent. Anyways, um, that's basically how the device works. The uh, pulses from the primary, they uh, rocket up the secondary, generating a current, and that oscillates back and forth through the secondary and the ground up to the capacitance. And um, the right pulses at the right time, like I said, when the uh, inductor makes that huge pulse, it rockets up, rockets back down, and by the time it's ready, that inductor, the capacitor should be discharging the inductor again which makes that pulse like um like a swing set. The pulse is the swing on a swing set and you gotta have the right push at the right time to get the biggest output you can. This output hap happens to be um close to a million volts. Uh, I've, I've got no way of measuring that right now but um it's a million volts at like a you know pico amps. It's not exactly pico amps but uh, not a substantial amperage to really do you any harm even though it does really sting if you're standing on the ground and you conduct an arc from this thing. Um, that, that's about it. What I've got here is I've got um, two control wires that come from the device. One is for the uh, high voltage, uh, just the transformers, which are hooked up to my 10 amp variac. And the other is um, here for the synchronous rotary spark gap. And that feeds back into the control box where I have a uh, phase control circuit. Now, this may, you know, you radio guys say, well, that's just a variac. Well, it is, but I've got it hooked up as a variable inductor. So, um, it's not wired like you would a variac. This is meant to, uh, lag the current flow into my, um, into my synchronous rotary spark gap. And, uh, that lag, when you got an alternating current, shifts the phase of the current, which means that it takes that, um, waveform and it moves it forwards or backwards. And, um, of course, I'm not doing that to the waveform that's uh, driving the transformers there, so I can control when those electrodes come into presentation as opposed to when, the, uh, when those capacitors are charging and how full they charge and when they discharge and all that kind of stuff. Looked up to my nice new 10 amp variac here.
And there we go.